Well, well, welcome to Lab Life with the Air Force Research Laboratory. Hi, I'm Michelle. And I'm Kenneth. Hello, folks. Today we are joined by Major Nyack to discuss being a test pilot, risk posturing, and how the culture around space testing is beginning to change. In three, two, one. Well, Major Nyack, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you. It's good to be back. Yeah, you you joined us way back when you were uh, just Captain Nyack for episode two of the Lab Life podcast. So I hope that you're bringing us some good material today because I, I really think that is really cooler than anything we've talked about since. Well, I'm I'm happy to be back. And that, that was a really interesting conversation. If I remember right, it was very, very cold outside at the time. So it's good to be warmer now. What have I been doing since? Well, right after I came back from the South Pole, actually, literally the, the day after I got back, I started at test pilot school uh, at Edwards Air Force Base. So this is a, it's a kind of the Air Force's premier flight training school for advanced testing. So we train test pilots, test engineers, and test weapon systems officers to basically lead and conduct full spectrum tests and evaluations of new aircrafts and aerospace weapon systems. So that was a year at uh, Edwards Air Force Base doing just all kinds of training and testing in all kinds of airplanes. Actually, I think we got to fly about 34 different aircraft as a class. So that was a unique, stressful, but very interesting year. Uh, And then I went to work. I'm currently at the 416th Flight Test Squadron, still at Edwards. So I went from... Uh, maybe, what, negative 70 Fahrenheit to the Mojave Desert, where it was 120 in the shade. Well, and and if you really get the whole spectrum, when you were in Antarctica, you had come from our research site at Maui, if I remember right. So you went from Hawaii, picturing tropical, work hasn't sent me to Maui yet. And then, then Antarctica, like literally crossing over the actual South Pole to go to your hut (laughs) to to work on your your (laughs) research out in the, you know, (laughs) <laughs> with your sled, literally, people, you need to listen to this podcast if you have an episode two. Then you went to the desert. So you're really getting the whole spectrum of, you know, weather patterns in your Air Force career. That is certainly true. That is certainly true. I went from the cold desert to the hot desert. But I'm just thinking, like you just mentioned the year you just spent. Is there a lot of adrenaline in, in that job? I mean, you're flying different aircraft and learning to test them out. Like, what's that like? So here's my experience. I think everybody will give you a slightly different story about test pilot school. At first, it is just overwhelming. The people, the the other students in the class are, they are incredible. Wherever they came from, whether it was piloting, engineering, or um, being a weapon systems officer, they were the best at whatever they did. So those folks bring just such a wide, diverse set of experiences that when, when you sit down and get to know these people, really unique people, uh, you're just, I was at least blown away. I was like, wow, this is, this is going to be a whole nother level. And then the intensity uh, that the instructors bring uh, to the daily schedule is, I can comfortably say that I've never been as stressed in a good way. I, I learned a lot from that stress, but it was an intense year. It's, it's kind of nonstop. Uh, it, there's, classes in the morning, and it's a full-up master's degree in flight test engineering. So you do those academics in the morning, and then you fly in the afternoon. Uh, And as they say, every sortie feels like a check ride. So you're graded on every time you go flying. And so somewhere in there, you've got to find time to to study and to prep for the flights. Uh, But you learn a lot uh, about how to make quick decisions about what's important, prioritize that, and, and make it happen. To start, it was just a complete overwhelming experience. And then, and then over time, I think everybody finds their niche. You sort of find a groove and you figure out how to prioritize things. You, you know so much more at the end of a, a, a year than you thought you could cram in. Uh, you know, so I, I guess what I'm saying is when you start off and you look at all these things that they have scheduled for you, you're just like, there's, there's no way that I can cram all of that into my brain. And by the end of it, uh, they've somehow done it. And it's exciting. And you feel prepared to, to go out and do this for real. That sounds really intense. And we were joking before we kicked off the podcast that you, you also have a, a PhD. So you're like major doctor Nyack or something like that. But you just <laughs> said that this, <laughs> this, this 
uh, test pilot school is more intense than any schooling you've been through so far. So that's pretty crazy. Absolutely. I think, well, partially it's compressed, right? You, you got to do it in a year. So there's, you know, there's exams every week uh, that you have to pass. There's flight check rides every so often that you have to pass. And, you know, the, the pace is set and you either keep up or fall off the train. But also the people that you're with are just, they take it to another level for you, if that makes sense. Uh, I, I found myself inspired every day by the instructors and, and students that were, the folks that were around me. And, you know, sometimes you look at someone, you're just like, you are, you're not struggling at all. You're right in your comfort zone. And I am struggling. I am running fast to keep up with you. And then sometimes the situation's reversed. And so really, I think what was cool was, uh, it was a new form of teamwork, in, in my opinion. I think my previous research experience, teamwork was a lot more, it was just a different flavor. And this was, I have to accept my shortcomings and I have to understand my strengths when there's, there's a time to offer my strengths to the team and that move us forward. Uh, and then there are other times when somebody else is better at something and I learn from them. Um, and so nobody can be a superstar in everything at once. That's, that's the lesson that I learned. We have to work together to figure out how we're going to get this done. Because there's just not enough time for one person to do everything. So how do we split it up such that we all play to our strengths and learn from our weaknesses? So with that in mind, um, would you say this is definitely one of the more candid locations you've worked in with people, like you said, having more of the, hey, like this is something you may need to improve on, or hey, like you did really great out there, but this is what you could do better. Like, is this definitely one of the places that you had that connection or kind of grew that out more? <laughs> Yes, absolutely. I think you got to have thick skin. I think uh, a flight debrief where you've messed up is uh, it's a humbling experience. And you have to sit there and not block out what you're hearing. Uh, you have to accept it, learn from it, and then you're going to redo it. You're going to you're going to do it again. And you have to be better. And so that I think was a was a good experience. There are times when it's just not a great idea to read your grade sheet because that's that's going to be a kick in a in a low place. Uh, but you know you take you take what you can from it. I'm being mildly facetious there, but you the goal is you learn from criticism and then turn it around and try to blow them away next time. So yeah, it was candid is candid is certainly a good word for it. It's the most politically correct thing you could probably say, Kenneth. Oh, just some candid <laughs> yeah, feedback. And he's like, they, they tore, tore me apart, you know? <laughs> <laughs> don't suck is, uh, is a common phrase. And, you know, as long as you don't suck again, or you don't suck in the same way again, you've learned something. So that's progress. Yeah, and that's a fair way of putting it. So I definitely want to make sure I pick the uh, the right word to ask the question. But I um, mean, it is enlightening to hear about. Um, you're right. Like working at test pilot school, and especially going through a lot of the phases that you did, they're tough. So I mean, I had that thick skin, like you mentioned, and internalized so much good teaching. Uh, sometimes when you're ready to hear it. Sometimes when you're not, is important. Um, and that all led you to where you're at today. So um, our question for you, kind of starting things off, was at the 416th Flight Test Squadron. Uh, what do they do for the Air Force? That's where I am right now. It's actually just across the parking lot from Test Pilot School. So I haven't gone far. The 416th Flight Test Squadron, where I'm at, uh, is a test unit that is responsible for flight tests of the F-16 Fighting Falcon, or as everybody knows it, the Viper. So at the 416th, we do Viper tests of all flavors. Uh, let's see, we do Viper systems tests, like improvements to radars, targeting pods, weapon systems that go on the F-16. Uh, we do Viper flight sciences testing, so like handling quality improvements while you're doing air refueling or breaking open the flight control computer to add new software capabilities. We also work with foreign partners from around the world, right? We're not, we're over 40 countries fly the F-16 around the world. So we work with numerous foreign partners to test improvements to their Vipers and also to make sure that they can work with us in the allied fight. So that's all of that kind of falls under the umbrella of F-16 test. Uh, we also provide test support to fifth generation flight tests. So uh, the great thing about Edwards, flying here sometimes can be like an air show. Just a week ago, I had the fortune to do a sortie with F-22s and F-35s in our flight. We, while we were waiting to take off, there was a B-52 that was doing touch and go landings. There was a MQ-9 Reaper that was doing its own flight tests. And then we also got to see T-38s when we were coming in for, for landing. 
So, you know, it's, it's, that's like we, we got to see bombers, fighters, trainers. We went to a tanker. So that's uh, tanker refueling. So sometimes flying at Edwards Air Force Base is like a, uh, it's, it's like being in an air show. So it's great that there's, there's, there's an F-16 squad, test squadron, F-22 test squadron, F-35 test squadron, bomber test squadron, cargo test squadron. And so we work with our brethren across the fleet so to give them a target to test their improvements against. So one of the things I work on, for example, is uh, interoperability testing and pilot proficiency. So trying to help our fourth generation aircraft work seamlessly with our fifth generation brethren. The squadron, the 416, actually has a very rich history date, dating back to 1942 when they were the 416th Bombardment Squadron flying B-17s in North Africa and the Mediterranean. So there's a great sense of morale and place at the unit. And that's kind of the 416th. We fly under the call sign Skulls. So we are the Skulls. Skulls rule! Wow. Cool. I mean, I think our Army people are, I think, excited because you just went back all the way to like Army days, Indeed. 1942. That's right. So now in, in modern day, you're at Edwards Air Force Base, but you're part of the Air Force Test Center, which um, when you talk about teamwork and stuff, the Air Force Test Center is another center, like Air Force Research Laboratory is a center yeah. as part of our Air Force Material Command. So you're our partner out there at Edwards, uh, since we have you know research facilities out there as well. Indeed, yes. Uh, and we work with our brethren at AFRL Edwards on a couple of projects as well. And something I was wondering, you kind of touched on this uh, true like a showcase of these different generations and types of aircraft. Um, so what is it like with you working with so many different pieces? Like, do you have to uh, shift your mindset when you're uh, working with a cargo team versus when you're working with like, a, let's say a bomber squadron versus a fifth generation fighter? Like, how do you keep it all straight in your head? Yeah, that's a great, great question. I think a I think a big part of it is training. And, you know, test pilot school very much has this, I guess, philosophy that uh, they like to say that with the lessons you learn here, you could test a fighter or you could test a toaster. And it's, it's all the same fundamentals, right? The way you attack the problem, frame the problem, and then come up with how to solve the problem. You can test anything. You can test a toaster. I think that's what it comes down to, whether it's cargo test or fighter test or unmanned vehicle test. It's the same foundation. A lot of these units obviously have test pilot school graduates embedded within them. And I think that all of us have the same education, which provides a fantastic foundation, I think, for how to conduct rigorous, systematic aircraft tests. For me specifically, uh, TPS obviously has a rich fighter history. So a lot of the lessons that I learned there translate directly to the fourth generation testing I'm involved in with the Skulls. The, the F-16 is a curriculum aircraft for a test pilot school. And so I got to learn kind of the initial hack at the systems there, and now I'm, I'm, I'm working on it for real. So that foundation, I guess, is, is really important to rely on. If that's set, then adapting to whatever new challenge is coming around the corner just becomes easier. You're not starting from scratch. So that helps us to go faster, work with other people, because we're all coming from this common foundation, this test fundamentals foundation. I think we, me, uh, are also fortunate because the F-16 has been flying since the 1970s. You know, in fact, its first flight was in 1974. So while it's involved just an amazing amount since then, we have this foundation. So we rely a lot on the experience of engineers who have been working Vipers for their whole career, as well as combat pilots who have flown the Viper operationally, and they bring their experience to the table. And then we put all that together, make this joint test team when we work on a project. Uh, we also bring in the researchers, which folks like AFRL, the Naval Research Lab, all these organizations who are on the bleeding edge, and then try to bring all of that to our joint test team and bring all these different pieces together, make all the different generations work. And that's super cool. Like first, before we go ahead, I got to say, I do have a model F-16 behind me, big fan of the craft. <laughs> so um, <laughs> that's great. It's uh, always so fascinating, though, to think about how like many people say, hey, the aircraft's getting on 50 years old. Like, How is that still relevant, especially in a warfighting domain today? And what's so cool about your guys' work and what you've already touched on is it, it sounds like there's constant updates being done to keep it ahead of the competition. Absolutely, yes. And those updates are not just for us. They're also for our allied partners, right? The nice thing about the F-16, like I said, 40 countries around the world, 40-plus countries fly the F-16. So improvements that they make we can apply to our jets and vice versa. I think that the, you know, the F-16 was, was designed to be just a daytime general purpose fighter. And, and now it's been adapted into so many different roles. It's so versatile. 
that keeps us on our toes, that's for sure. Um, and so, you know, the 416th uh, is also the Global Fighter Power CTF, uh, or the Combined Test Force. So that, that Combined Test Force concept is crucial, right? So we got the lab as part of that test team, we got the operational folks, the combat pilots, the engineers, the testers. And so that is what keeps it all together, I guess, keeps the F-16 constantly moving forward. Speaking of other updates happening to aircraft, you know a major project you're working on with the flight test squadron is replacing the T-38 trainer for the new T-7. Uh, why does it need a replacement? That's a good question. And it's, it's especially tricky because you just asked me, how is the F-16 still relevant from the 1970s? And I told you it's still relevant. And now I'm about to tell you about a 1960s trainer and why it's not relevant. <laughs> <laughs> However, uh, so the mission of the T-38 is training. Right, it's it's a great jet trainer. In fact, that it was the world's first first supersonic jet trainer. But it flew for the first time back in 1959. The jet is 30 years older than most of the pilots who fly it. But right now, this aircraft, the T-38, is how fighter pilots learn to fly fighters. This is their first jet. But it's just a different fight for fighter aircraft now than it was back in the T-38's day. So while stick and rudder skills are still the core of what a pilot does, fighter aircraft today are their technological marvels, I think, light years ahead of what the T-38 has. And so a fighter pilot in the combat environment is more reliant on avionics and systems integration. So, so systems on board the airplane as opposed to the airplane itself. And they rely on that rather than the sort of seat of the pants type of flying. So the T-7 or the T-7 Red Hawk is the Air Force's response to kind of training fighter pilots of the future. So these fifth generation airplanes, digital jets, such as the F-22 or the F-35, the systems are more advanced. Learning to fly the airplane is not the challenge. Training pilots to fly while being involved so deep in all of these very complex systems, mission systems on board the airplane, that is the real challenge. So the hope is that the T-7, being a clean sheet digital jet, will allow for an easier transition and a better on-ramp to the advanced fighters that are flying in missions today. And so uh, the 416th is going to be testing prototype T-7 starting in just a few months. And so that's very exciting uh, for me personally. I was excited. I'm excited to be on the T-7 test team, kind of the exact sort of thing I wanted to be involved with when I went to test pilot school. And that's really cool. Like one thing I was kind of wondering as well, you kind of touched on that um, for a lot of folks, especially thinking about fifth generation fighters. Uh, are you able to kind of go into that headspace of what it is like to work with the NA digital fighter and why that is so different? In, in a way, I think that we have, at least for me personally, because it's just an entire airplane, there's so much test that needs to be done. We tend to focus on our little piece of the sandbox. But absolutely, I think folks at different levels are doing that. Very cool. So, I mean, that, that's a really cool way of kind of showing what you guys are not only doing currently, but kind of what it looks like to work at the 416th. A lot of stuff you touched on, which is really cool, is just how unique it is to test in this space. But um, if you were to have, let's say, to condense that all down, what makes testing the Air Force such a unique experience? And why is it so cool to be part of it? Well, I think every tester is going to give you a different answer to this question, but I'll, I'll give you my first, let's see, I don't know if it's necessarily unique. But I like that the Air Force has an entire organization centered around development and test. So what that means, it's got one foot in research, which is my background. Uh, and obviously, you guys know this very well, working for AFRL. Um, so it's got one foot there. But it's, it's also sort of the final gateway between an aircraft or a system leaving the development domain and sort of going out to the fleet, right? So production. Uh, so the test professionals, I think, are gatekeepers in a way. And I, I love being part of that environment. One foot in research, one foot in operations. And we're, you know, try that balancing act between the two. I think the thing that I find unique about testing in the Air Force is the skills that it builds within me and within my teammates. The skill of asking why and being surrounded by people who also want the answer to why. That's just great. But also, you know, everyone that I work with is operationally minded. And what I mean by that is the folks that I work with understand that at some point we have to call it good enough. But where you draw that line and how you draw that line, especially when it comes to high performance fighter aircraft, I think that's a skill that doesn't really come naturally. That's a skill that's taught. It's an analytical skill. It comes with exposure to the problem set. And, and that's what I like. That's what I think I find unique is that the Air Force has this organization that is set up 
to develop professionals whose job it is to decide where to draw that line. One more thing I think that I find super unique is contingency management. The people that I work with are professional risk mitigators. They've got the right passion, if you will, for what they do. They want to do a good job, but they're always ready and always thinking about all of the contingencies that you have to be prepared for, right? Because tests, there is some risk that you're taking. There, there are unknowns. You're out there to find the answers, but you're ready for when it goes south. So at least for me, it forces me to be on my game when I come into a mission to force myself to think two, three, four steps ahead of the airplane or the test and to be ready to respond calmly and professionally to contingencies or off nominal conditions. As some of the missions will, will get your heart racing. You learn on the job to be calm and, and deal with that. And I think that's a unique skill. Um, that's, it's tough to find exposure to that on a consistent basis. I think we've managed to find that. I find that very unique. Can you even turn that off? You know, always looking for the, I mean, you just drive in your car around and you're looking at all these things that could happen or in your personal life because you're just in that <laughs> in that mode? <laughs> that is a fantastic question. Here's, here's what I'll say. Uh, so I own a Tesla Model 3, which is a really unique car in that they're constantly pushing software updates to make improvements. So it's the only car I know of, it's the only car I've ever owned that it, I actually feel it's gotten better since I bought it. But... To answer your question, Michelle, yes. So when I get a new software update, for example, uh, maybe three months ago, we got a software update that allows us to drive on autopilot on city roads. It stops the traffic light, starts, holds lanes, changes lanes in city traffic. And my tester brain was very definitely on because, you know, and I, I feel like this is kind of what I was taught, right? This build up approach is you don't just jump in at the deep end. You figure out where you're going and what the unknowns are and then walk your way toward it. I felt like I had this response to the Tesla suddenly driving on city roads and stopping at traffic lights and starting at traffic lights. I, I was very guarded about it and I felt like I was constantly watching the system. How is it responding? How, how does it do when the, when the sunlight, when I'm driving into the sunset and my front camera is blinded? I can barely tell what color that light is. Can the car tell? Uh, does it see this truck that's sitting right in my blind spot? Is it going to hold the speed limit? Is it going to aggressively brake? And, you know, part of, uh, I think, Tesla's model there is to constantly improve the car based on user experience. I definitely found myself driving very differently every time I get a, a new software update, as opposed to when I understand all of the characteristics, then I'm like, okay, I'm comfortable here. I'm not comfortable here, so I'm just going to kick it off and do it myself. Yeah, so I guess I guess you really can test a, a toaster or a car. There you go. I, I think that helps me really understand a little bit closer to do what you do in your maybe your day job during that experience because you know I could relate to maybe not feeling confident that you know something would work and then you know I'm gonna trust the system that it works and but I need to be ready if my car doesn't identify the red light so I can put my foot on the brake or something like that. Exactly. Right. And so, you know, that's that's exactly what I was talking about earlier with contingencies, right? Like you just you just get a, a little prickly feeling. Like for example, for me, I very quickly discovered that when the Tesla is driving into the sunset, uh it, it it'll it'll suddenly kick off because it decides, nope, nope, I don't like it. I have it already disabled. And then other times it's it's just fine and I know I can be a, a little less interactive with it. If we go back a little bit to Ken's kind of question that kicked this off, he was talking about testing in the Air Force. And, you know, the Department of the Air Force now is the actual service of the Air Force and the Space Force. Right. Um, you know, you have a, quite the research and background in space. And obviously, AFRL has a huge mission ar around space. Uh, how is that playing into uh, your experience at Edwards? One of the conversations that's ongoing for Space Force is the setup of a space test pilot school. Um, and so, like Ken and I spoke earlier, you know, TPS started as a three-month course and then expanded to a six-month course, and then they added another six-month just for systems, making it the kind of year course that it is today. But it took 50 years, and it's evolving. And so Space Test Pilot School, the, the goal there is, okay, now the Space Force needs testers at all levels who can plan and execute high-risk tests in space, people who can figure out how to push our space vehicles to their limits in a safe and rigorous manner. 
so we don't have to figure that out in the middle of a, a space war. I think Space Test Pilot School, its curriculum, its setup, and its creation of these, these qualified test professionals, I think it's going to have a huge impact, a historical impact, on how operations in the Space Force go. As a member of the Society of Flight Test Engineers, you know, like I say, if you test an aircraft, you can test a toaster, you can test a spacecraft. Um, in that vein, I, I am kind of interested professionally, and especially with my background in space tests, for Air Force Space Command before it was Space Force, um, just interested in, in how they're going to how they're going to do this and the mentality of of space test and what that takes. And I think that would have been our you know our next question because you've you've written a paper about uh, the importance of changing the culture around space testing. You know what does that involve? What are you asserting in your in your research? Yeah, absolutely. So so let's let's set the stage a little. You know, here we are with the new branch of the military, the Space Force, the newest since the Air Force itself. We know space is now a warfighting domain, a contested place where we're going to need to have an operational capability. But in my I think operations begins with test to eke out all the capabilities from a space vehicle and to determine what the limits of our warfighter spacecraft are against the enemy. We need to test. We need to figure out where those boundaries are. I think that's fairly intuitive. I think most people would agree with that statement. Yeah, we need to know where the limits are. But here's the problem. That's at least to date. That's not the mindset that space professionals have trained with. We're used to protecting space assets like they're one-of-a-kind diamonds because in a way they, they are. Once we launch them, it's not like we can repair them and they cost a lot of money. And so the culture of space operations, which is a culture that I've experienced in my earlier in my Air Force career, that culture is extremely risk averse. We don't take risks in space. And, you know, the authority for approvals to do things uh, is still very, very high up in the leadership. When there's an anomaly on board a spacecraft, well, when there's an anomaly on board an aircraft, um, you call back home. The pilot ha- is authorized to take certain decisions in line with their checklist. Um, they call back home and they get a uh, what's called a, an op soup or a SOF. So somebody who is an aircraft expert uh, to sort of you know provide suggestions to them. But essentially, they're you know they they go do what they need to do to fix the problem and make a safe safe landing. When there's an anomaly on board a spacecraft, it gets briefed up the chain. I've seen it briefed up to a three star general. And that's just not a paradigm that's sustainable in a wartime environment. But here's the thing. Like, it, it's, not, it's not unreasonable. We haven't tested these spacecraft to their limits. So we have no idea what the limits are. None. So we have unique assets that we need to recover. And the unknowns are huge. It just makes sense that that decision authority would be at a very high level. So how do we change that? I think we change that with test. And that's sort of what the thesis of my paper is. I think it's trained testers go out and find those limits, and they know how to do that in a very deliberate manner. There's some risk, but again, they are trained risk mitigators, right? We talked about that earlier. And so I just think we need to get out of our own way and test spacecraft to the point of failure, though not into failure, because then we know what they can do, what they can survive. And that's how we get to a place where the operator can make a real-time decision on how to rescue their vehicles, just like a pilot would in an aircraft without needing to go up to the three-star general level. And then we can get to a place where the enemy can be putting effects on our space vehicles and the operator just responds. No leadership intervention necessary, no fog of war, no delays. We just respond. And you know that's, that's how uh, the fighter pilots do it. They are trained, they know their vehicle's limits, and they take it to the limits in a fight if they need to. And that culture, I think, begins, that culture for the Space Force begins with test. And that's sort of the thesis, if that makes sense. And what you're really talking about now, because I think I've probably watched just enough space movies that I automatically went to (laughs) Matt Damon and George Clooney and, you know, some uh, other, you know, celebrities lost in space because of their spaceship. They didn't know what they could do with it. But spacecraft, I mean, we're talking like satellites, uh, research vehicles, not not necessarily Mm -hmm. things that are manned. What is an example of pushing that to the limit? I don't know how to push a satellite to the limit or do they just operate in these like really narrow fields? Like this is where we can put the satellite. This is what it can do. We never try anything else. That is exactly right. Uh, so uh, for an aircraft, for example, we have a thing called the heart of the envelope, the aircraft performance envelope, right? And so within that envelope, the idea is that you can fly it with carefree handling, right? But any qualified operator 
as long as they maintain the airspeed or the altitude or the, um, you know, whatever condition within that defined envelope, they can do whatever they need to do, right? For a spacecraft, however, we don't know where that envelope is. And so what we do is we, we launch it, we check it out, we operate it, and then once it works, we keep it there in that condition and don't change it, right? Because we, we don't want to risk anything. We know that this works. And so we're not going to move. We're not going to experiment too much around that. We're just going to let the vehicle operate in a stable manner. And so I think that that needs to change for one. Uh, but also, so you mentioned, you know, George Clooney and, you know, shows like Star Trek and things like that. There are manned vehicles, right? So there's humans in the loop making decisions. Here, we just don't have the benefit of looking at our spacecraft and looking it over and saying, oh, I think, I think this is what's going on. What do you think? Yep, I agree. And then let's, let's go change it. So there's this long discussion that we get into about, about rescuing it. That's kind of the culture that we need to change, I think. What I mean by that is um, there's, there is no envelope expansion plan for new spacecraft. For example, um, determine the maximum specific impulse possible if you need to do an avoidance maneuver. You don't know what that maximum is because you've never built up to it. What's the minimum time to desaturate reaction wheels on a spacecraft so that it can slew and point at a target that you want to have imaged? Don't know. Uh, we've never saturated the reaction wheels and then tried to desaturate it quickly. Are we able to take images even at the most extreme illumination conditions without damaging the sensor? Well, we don't know what damages the sensor because we only take images in favorable conditions. Um, and the operators just, you know, there's unknown, so they're not going to take that risk and risk burning out optics. So I think that's more what I mean by pushing the envelope is let's figure out what the thing is capable of. Of course, we've got that nominal operating condition, but when are we ever nominal in wartime? I think that mentality permeates down into daily operations. I think if the vehicle has not been cleared for anything except heart of the envelope operations, any deviation from the norm essentially becomes a test event, right? And that's why I think even the smallest spacecraft failures are briefed up to the executive level and they require developer input before any action can be taken because you need to do all these tests and simulations to say, well, we've never been here. What do we do now? But maybe if there was a... a a test campaign on every spacecraft by dedicated test professionals, you know, there would be some answers and it wouldn't be a critical event. It's just, uh, yep, I know what to do. We've been here before. Let's do it. So something that interests me in that field is uh, thinking about a lot of this risk aversion, especially in the space community and testers here, like you've been touching on, is do you think it's going to have to be part of the culture of using um, either more affordable aircraft or maybe like CubeSats or different platforms to build up that trust that people want to say, hey, if we can push the envelope with these, we can then scale that up to larger models or things that you, like you said beforehand, are these almost one of a kind, very expensive vehicles? I don't know. I, I, I simply don't. Um, I think that could be part of it. That's certainly part of the argument, right? Is that, okay, if you have your spacecraft that's a one-of-a-kind diamond, you're never going to be able to convince anybody to do anything even low risk on it. So let's, let's build hundreds of smaller components. That way, if we lose one, we don't care. That's certainly an answer. I think that, though, if we're setting up a brand new service and the mission of that service is to protect and defend a warfighting domain, then we have to give them warfighter skills and abilities, right? We have to give them the ability to respond to unexpected events from an enemy. We need to drive the decision authority down to the lowest level. And you just can't do that if you don't know how your system works, right? Then you're sort of, you're doing what we call cowboy commanding. It's, uh, you're just shooting from the hip and hoping that your bullet goes where you want it to go. Instead, well, why don't we, and you know, Space Test Pilot School, I think, is going to be a huge part of this uh, conversation. Why don't we emphasize experience and bring together the R&D and organizational space test communities and address risk in a better manner for spacecraft, kind of the way that Air Force Test Pilot School has trains for Air Force aircraft. Now, obviously, these are different domains with different problems, right? I can lay an eye on my aircraft at any time, uh, and, and that helps me. And, you know, in space, we can't do that. So there, we certainly can't execute tests in the same way in air as in space. But I think that's why there'll be an Air Force Test Pilot School and a Space Force Test Pilot School. 
the point is, I think, that we need to understand what test brings to the table. And that is risk, yes, but measured, properly mitigated risk. And that's what's going to open up more doors for the warfighter later on, as opposed to saying, well, I'm going to build a hundred of these, but I'm still going to keep the same old approach that I did before to my one of a kind billion dollar assets, right? I think we need to be prepared to lose a couple of those assets because we're certainly going to lose it in a wartime scenario. And certainly when Air Force airplane folks do O plans or operations plans, you know, force reduction uh, is, is something that you plan around. So you need to be ready for that. It's, let's just accept that um, and then try to mitigate it instead of being surprised by it. And another aspect of that I think would be very interesting. Uh, again, I want to see if you may know this, and if not, that that's totally fine, or at least kind of see what ideas you have around it. Um, when it comes to this, like, let's say, the space test piloting school, um, do you think for the first instructors and people coming in, is this going to be a blend of both, let's say, test pilot school from like what you've seen, and these operators have already worked in the space domain coming together to kind of build up that risk posture, like how they can best teach this new generation how to accomplish that goal? Yeah. Absolutely. That is, that is what they are setting out to do. And I hope, I hope that they can do it, right? Because if, if there's too much of Air Force test pilot school in there, well, then I think the people that go there are going to think of it as, well, that's cool, but that doesn't really apply to me. Uh, if there's too much focus on space, then we're just going to bring the old baggage in and call it a different name. So yeah, I think it's great. And I, the Air Force Test Center is 100% supporting the setup of the space test pilot school right now. They have a space test fundamentals course. So the first class was just selected for that. And these are folks that are experienced in space test and are going to be coming to Air Force Test Pilot School to receive a short course on how to do tests, right? How to test a toaster. And then, hey, you take that home to space <laughs> and, uh, and tell us how our lessons apply to your domain. Um, and, you know, I think that's a great place to start because that's how Test Pilot School started. It started with a three-month course and it grew from there. And so, yes, exactly what you said is what I hope happens. If you could look into your own, you know, the future of your own crystal ball, do you see, do you see yourself maybe helping teach in that arena? Or, or are you signed up on a mission to Mars yourself? Or did you sign up to try to become an astronaut? You know, what's the future for you? You've been Antarctic windsurfing, te you know, testing all these different aircraft, you know. What's next? Oh, God, I wish I had the answer for you. I really do. I think about that all the time. Like, what do I want to do next? I don't know. Uh, ask me in a year. I'll maybe have a better answer for you. But I don't know. So I, I'm loving what I'm doing right now. Uh, like we talked about the T7 earlier. I think it's I think it's incredible to get to test the newest aircraft in the Air Force fleet. And I'm, I'm very excited about that. Uh, I think at our last podcast, we talked about, you know, I was very enthusiastic about my Antarctic research. And I told myself I'd only leave for something really unique. And, and this is it. And I think my answer is still the same. I would leave this only for something really unique. Uh, I just don't know what that is yet. <laughs> We like, you know, we're right. at about a year and a half later and still you're doing something way cooler, like you said, from Antarctica in some cases. So I guarantee something just as neat will happen or you'll be working on something even cooler here. So we'll oh, be meeting you. again. Then. Don't you worry. <laughs> thank you. I, I will say this, you know, like when when folks ask me, what has the Air Force done for you? It's, it's like, well, I, I think I mentioned this on our last podcast is uh, I don't really know any other place where I could go from being an Air Force research lab, like literally basic research researcher to going to the South Pole, to backseating in supersonic airplanes, to doing space operations, uh, leading space operations, to getting a PhD. Like th these are all very wildly different things that the Air Force has allowed me to do uh, and, and stay employed. And I, I can't think of at least a civilian job that, that combines all of those different, wildly different fields <laughs> into one, one job, one paycheck. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't seen it, you know. <laughs> so now that we've had a, a pretty good conversation talking about space testing and kind of getting a good idea of what you've been doing um, to kind of like round things out here, uh, do you have any advice for people looking to get into the, um, the Air Force or even doing something similar to you? You've had such a unique journey. Um, what kind of wisdoms do you have to share with newcomers? So are we talking about newcomers to the Air Force or people who are thinking about joining the Air Force? I would say, let's say people, maybe people considering, people considering joining the Air Force, what would you tell them? 
Well, the first thing I would say is know what you're getting into. Uh, there's, there's good and there's bad to everything. But as long as the good works for you, you know, and it's, it's an enriching experience, then, then chase that experience. Uh, so the first thing I would say to, if you're considering joining the Air Force, know what you're getting into. What is your career field like? Uh, what are the opportunities that'll be available to you? And does that mesh with what you're passionate with? Because there's no job that's perfect. Um, even an astronaut, I'm sure, I, I don't know this personally, but I'm sure there are days when they wake up and they're just, they're just tired of being an astronaut. But what keeps them going are the good things, the things that they are passionate about, that they feel the job gives to them and that they can give to the job. And I think that's true for any job, right? I mean, no matter what job it is, the president being the chief of staff of the Air Force, being the uh, a brand new uh, lieutenant to the Air Force or a uh, airman first class. I think uh, just know what you're getting into, understand what you can bring to the job, and then try to make the job work for you. I think there are so many unique opportunities, right? So I've had the opportunity to be an engineer, a scientist, and then an engineer again in, in wildly different fields. So space, kind of a space operations, planetary science, and now flight test engineering. Uh, that's, you know, across the development spectrum. I would say that there are many leaders in the Air Force that try to put their hands up and say, what do you want to do next and how can I make it happen for you? And as long as we have those people uh, in leadership positions, and you can find those people in the Air Force, you're going to find something that makes you happy. Yeah, we've certainly heard some amazing stories, uh, just the people we get to interview for this podcast. Uh, I think they would all are, not all of them, but many of them have said that they have the best job in the Air Force. Right. What is that intersection of things I care about and things the Air Force needs me to do? If I can find myself in that intersection, boy, I'm, you know, it's going to be a mutually beneficial relationship. And that's, that's what everyone's looking for, right? Yeah, because I would much rather talk to someone that has gone to Antarctica than be that person that's dra dragging the sled <laughs> across the, you know, the, the actual South Pole. Like, it's really cool. I get to tell my friends, like, I got to talk to this guy that was walking across the South Pole. Not like I was there, <laughs> you know. Um, and my so, fingers really hurt and I haven't had feeling in them for two weeks. Valid. Yeah. Valid. Exactly. We all have our callings. But I have one final question that's just been like in my head. So test pilot school. TPS, like, do you guys do office space jokes, you know, like, <laughs> like at all? Does that come up at all? Uh, yes, absolutely. So uh, the, the great thing about TPS, right, is it, it is a grind um, and they put you through the grind, but they know that. And so everybody kind of has a sense of humor, I think, uh, uh, in the building about, you know, all the instructors have been through it. They've, they've done it themselves. They've suffered. And so, for example, on our classroom door, uh, we had memes up, right? So something ridiculous would happen, like, I don't know, like you would get a grade sheet uh, that said, uh, if you're a pilot, you got a grade sheet that says, um, acceptable performance considering limited piloting experience, and you're like a 10-year pilot. You're like, well, that's a meme. And so, <laughs> you know, so you stick it on the door of the classroom, uh, and it's there for anyone to see. And that's that's okay. And so a lot of the... Uh, by, by the end of the year, we had the entire door filled with layers of memes. Like you could lift up one meme and find another one underneath it. And it just kind of documented the experience of uh, <laughs> being, being there, going through that, and then what you took away from it. So yes, uh, <laughs> office space jokes, fair game, all kinds of jokes. Just, you know, jokes at the instructor's expense, jokes at other students' expense, jokes that, you know, just the experience itself and what you took away from it. Yeah, very candid, I'm sure, to use one of Ken's words, but. <laughs> but in a good way, right? It's, it's at the end of the day, I think everyone would say that, or most everyone would say, I can't speak for everyone, uh, that it was an enriching experience. Like I, I feel like, yes, it was stressful, but I feel like I walked away with a better idea. And I thought it was pretty good coming in, right? I think we all did. We all thought we were pretty good coming in, but we left even better. And that's a pretty unique thing to be able to say is I feel like I learned how to manage my own stress better, take criticism better. And those are life skills that I can, that I can take with me throughout my career. So, you know, and a couple of jokes along the way, just to, to remember the good times. Absolutely. Well, thanks for joining us today. I, 
I can't really wait until the next time we have you on a podcast. I know we we want to talk to some of your colleagues about some of the related work we're doing. So we'll get to talk to you then, or yeah. if it's farther down the road when you find that next you know dream job, whether that's uh, actually going <laughs> to space or you know I could also like listening to you now. I could see hear you like animating like a or voicing uh, anim animated character or something like that, whatever <laughs> the next thing on your list is, uh, we want to hear it. So uh, awesome. hopefully, hope to talk to you soon. Thanks for joining us today. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I hear you guys are going to talk to some former coworkers of mine uh, at uh, AFRL Space Vehicles. Yes. Absolutely. They might be on a new podcast. Yeah, we have Christina Strait and Evelyn Kent. So look forward to that for technically part two of this, talking about risk aversion and what they're doing in satellite work from cradle to grave. So it's some very exciting stuff. So uh, listen in, folks. Absolutely. And those guys, uh, they were my co-authors on that paper that we talked about. Those two are uh, true space experts. They deal with cradle to grave, like you mentioned, experimental spacecraft. So every time uh, it's throwing them for a loop and they have... Uh, figured out the way across, you know, multiple decades of experience between them to uh, how space tests, I'm sure uh, that they are the people, people like them uh, hopefully have the answers for how we're going to execute space tests in the future as the Space Force. So I, I'm sure that's going to be a great conversation. We're very excited. So um, audience here that's listening in, make sure uh, we'll have that anticipation build up, but expect to hear this uh, to drop quickly uh, after this episode so we can have a good old two-parter. So uh, get excited. And of course, like Michelle mentioned, we'll definitely be talking to Major Nyack again. So you've, uh, if you have any questions for him and about his career, please leave them in the comments on our social media profiles and we'll all reach out to him, see if we can get them answered. Thanks for having me, you guys. It's great, great to chat with you again. Yeah, thank you. Make sure to follow us on social media at Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, and YouTube at AF Research Lab. And remember, stay curious. Logging off.